listening to the Pagan Center Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to our panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest-running and most popular pagan podcasts. Feel welcome to call in live or submit listener feedback via our website, PaganCenteredPodcast.com. And welcome to this episode of PCP, the Pagan Centered Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm Amber. I'm Brandon. I'm Scurv. Also joining us tonight are... I'm Amanda. I'm Barrett. I'm Kara. I'm Miles. Nuria. I'm Saturn. And I'm Amber's mom. All right. Yay. Because we Amber, seem... I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because we seem to suck at satire, uh, we decided to do an episode on what we actually are, are, are going to, you know recommend people do when your child says they're pagan and uh, we'll be doing this just in time for international pagan coming out day occurring worldwide on may the second including an event at the white house you can find more information about that at pagancomingoutday.com so we'll be right back after these messages and we're back amber this is your episode how about you take the start I suppose I could do that. Okay, um, we joked about it last episode, and as much as we joked about it, it's, it's kind of serious. If your kid, if you find out your kid's pagan, the first thing is, please don't panic. Chances are the child's already feeling awkward enough. Um, there's so many things going on, especially once they hit the teenage years, where the hormones are going wild. I swear they should be called horror moans instead of hormones. So they're trying to break free. They're trying to to make their individuality known, and they're also at the same time still looking for approval. So you panicking is just going to escalate the situation into an argument, even if you think you're right, because we know there are a lot of uh, paths out there that believe that this is the one way, whatever you're doing is wrong. Whether you believe that or not is not the point. The point is to keep an open dialogue so the situation can be resolved in whatever way it ends up being resolved. If you panic, it it puts their defense mechanisms right on edge. So they're more likely to snap and lash out or seclude and just not tell you anything afterwards. Um, No matter how you've raised them, all kids go through that stage where they question everything. This is normal. It's not you did something wrong. It's not the church did something wrong. It's not the community did something wrong. It's kids, no matter what age, will learn about different things and be curious about different things. And this is okay. This is something to encourage them to learn about different things. Also, some people are just pulled to different paths, and when they're going on that life shift, it's quite normal for them to kind of try out a couple different ones before they find one that really pulls to them. It's a possibility that they could go through several different paths before settling on one. So it's quite possible that they just want to poke around in other things before coming back to the original one they grew up with. Through this, they've also more than likely, as much as it may seem that kids are fickle, yes, they are, but they also tend to have done some sort of research rather than just taking it and chosen a flavor of the week, so to speak. I mean, yes, they could go, oh, that's cool, and go from there, but a good percentage of the time, 
they've done a little bit of reading. They've done talking to people who have in that, even if it's classmates, there's still some sort of research done. Is it professional grade research that they could write a college dissertation? Probably not. But don't assume that because they're young that they haven't done anything with it. As everybody um, nods and smiles and agrees. <laughs> right? There's 11 yes. people in here. Somebody can say something. <laughs> I think everybody's having. We can talk. I think everybody's having post-traumatic stress syndrome right now. I think um, it's not even a question of paganism versus whatever path you happen to follow. I mean, this could go as far as Judaism to uh, Baptist or Baptist to Presbyterian, or um, you know somebody going to Buddhism, whatever it happens to be, um, there, it's not just paganism out there that these issues might come up. Um, right. So, um, that's my two cents. Um, I think it's, it's sometimes when, when the, when children are at this age, they, they may, question their actual beliefs that they were raised and talking to other people that they go to school with and they they learn of other religions and they may pick what they like out of each religion I don't like this in my religion oh this religion oh we don't have to do this we don't do this I like this and I think Sometimes that this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. Sometimes they don't want that control that's expected of you. So they they go to something that feels a little bit more relaxed and not so, doesn't seem like it's pushed down your throat, but may not actually know what they're getting into. And if they get into something, they may find that there's something in that religion that they don't like either. So it's almost that they're trying to pick and choose but they don't know what. I can see that. Um, I oh. know... Go ahead, Miles. Um, for some teenagers and kids, I think that along with just the rebellious nature of if mom and dad do this, then I have to do something that's not this as to assert my identity, um, but I also want to find something that appeals to them on two levels, one that seems fun, and also something that seems like it's not a lot of work, because most kids will try to take the path of least resistance. Right. If there's something that involves laborious hours and hours of research and recitation, as opposed to something that seems like a big happy frat party, they're going to go the way of the big happy frat party. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Most kids. <clears throat> there are some nerds out there that defy the odds. There are. This is true. They're adorable, too. They're <laughs> also, they're, nerdy. Uh, some may even feel that um, whether it's something along the same path it might something is not quite right in their own path you know with the path they grew up with uh and might look for something maybe even something a little bit stricter or something that's not as strict as you were saying but there's just something that doesn't settle with them well and um might choose something that's close to what they they believe but um has a different take or something else along those lines. But I think um, keeping that 
communication open to understand what it is that they might be looking for. It, you know, they want to feel important that they belong and not this is something you have to do. You, you know, if I can relate, um, because, I mean, it wasn't that horribly long ago that I was a teenager. Um, but from when I was a younger child and through when I was a teenager, um, I did, you know, I wanted to be connected to religion. I wanted to be connected to spirituality. I wanted to be connected to deity. And I, and I desperately tried because I wanted to please my parents to do that through the church that was our family church. Um, and it wasn't that there was anything wrong with the church. I still like that church. I like the people in it. It, it was the religion itself. It was the, the deity itself that I was not connected to and just, and just could not, could not. And, and I knew it from a fairly young age. Um, and I, I knew I did have a connection to deities that I was continuously told were made up. They were stupid fables. They were stories. They were myths. It wasn't real. Only superstitious people long ago believed in that, but we're so much more enlightened now. And, and, and it was that continuous, and this was not done out of spite. No one did that to me out of spite. But they kept reinforcing the idea to me that what I thought was silly and stupid and impossible, and it left me in a spiritual limbo for a long period of my life. Until finally I found out that there are other people who are making offerings to Zeus. There are other people who light a fire and, and pray to Hestia. Um, and this is not stupid or superstitious and it's real and um, and it deserves to be taken seriously. And, and I'm very, while I'm extremely understanding, I'm very unhappy that um, neither my family nor my community or anyone was really opening, open to listening to me, hearing what I said, and letting me explore this. And I, you know, I feel I missed out on a lot of time spent wandering. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was um. Well, and that was a really I, long-winded way of saying that sometimes kids aren't just messing around. They really do think about things, feel things, that kind of stuff. This isn't a phase, and and you need to take them seriously because many times they are serious. I can't claim yeah. hormones as I didn't find it that late. I found, well, walked away at about the age of nine, so... I, it's not always um, Go ahead, Miles. My family used to um, go to church every Sunday. And I remember as a young boy in the pews, I was just bored out of my skull. It just didn't, it didn't click, it didn't connect, it didn't mean anything. As a boy of like four, five, six, up until I was in my teens, and we went occasionally, it still, it had no meaning for me. It, it had no significance at all. I felt much more at home. Remember this, at being eight years old and walking around the churchyard, looking at all the graves in this cemetery next door, and being enthused at how trees seem to grow this shape over here and that shape over there and that just seemed that just seemed like God is in the tree, God isn't in the building is what I felt as a young kid. Um I didn't really know what to do with these thoughts until my older brother, when I was twelve, he was about fifteen, had a part time job working at a metaphysical bookshop in Montreal and he brought home pentagrams and a thames and a chalice and he brought home a an, a what to do to prepare for your initiation handbook and 
I looked at all these and I read the handbook and I read these things and it just hit me like a hammer. This, this is something important. This is real. Pay attention to this. Don't let this go. This, I didn't know why, but this is big. This means something. And so for quite a while, like, oh, about 10 years, I had all those mementos and I, and I elected what few th- things I could find, um, like the really ludicrous books on witchcraft from the 1970s, um, and so I attained all of these things, and I really thought that stuff I read about Hebel Leek and, 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 and um, Lady Sheba and those things, that that's what it was all about okay fine um but then i met some 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 real life modern pagans who introduced me to to um pagan festivals and pop lots and rituals and things and it seemed a lot less dramatic and less cheesy horror movie ish than the st- stuff I'd been reading and thinking was legit, but it also seemed to have a much more sincere foundation of, um, it had a heartbeat. All the things that I would read in the books about witchcraft in the 1970s and all the various hands holds her books, all those things, they were interesting, they were fascinating, it was, it was, it, it was amazing pondering for a boy of 13 oh my god she's naked really Ooh, you know but it didn't have a heartbeat and then i met these real pagans and they introduced me to a whole network of people where it all made sense and all these things i'd had begin to fall into place i knew what the elements meant and why and why Lamas is over here and why ostara is over there and all these things and i was drifting even further and further and further away from from the Christian church, as if I was ever there in the first place. Um, When I was about uh, 28, I think, my father called me on Christmas morning to yell at me for not going to church. It's Christmas morning. You have to be in church. You, You know, all this. He had never, through all this, accepted that I'm just not Christian. Um, and actually, it wasn't until I, until I published a book about how to teach witchcraft, because because my father is himself a a college professor, and so I so I wrote and published a a teaching textbook, and that's when he finally accepted. Okay, this has legitimacy. Then he embraced my faith years, 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 la- years after I had. We were both adults by then, and it took that long for him to realize that, okay, Miles does know what he's talking about. This, okay, yeah, then he got it. Yeah, and I can... I hear a lot of stories from a lot of people, and they're all... Well, most of them, I won't say all of them, are are resoundingly similar, is that you know, yeah. nobody know. understood until you're a grown adult and you can explain it and something clicks and they go, oh, you don't yeah. eat children in the woods. <laughs> okay. Well, um, <laughs> my, my, oh, where are we? Um, my grandmother told me about her grandmother, this is in the north of England, a good, a good Protestant family in Yorkshire. She, my great-great-grandmother, absolutely believed that Jews have horns and they eat their babies. No question. It's just a fact. Jews have horns, they eat their babies. She just knew this as, as if to say grass is green and, you know, water is wet. That's kind of weird. Yeah, well. 
some people believe stereotypes and believe the horror stories they hear. Some, some people believe that every single Muslim alive wants to kill everybody else and blow up the nearest airport. You know, nah, just just my relatives. Oh, okay. <laughs> my boss, I, I have relatives over in Syria, and I, I, <laughs> well, let's just say they don't have fond feelings. So, maybe just them. <laughs> <laughs> say what, say what I will about my parents. I, they, amongst everything I've ever said about them, and public and private, uh, they're actually very accepting. They, they, they meet the criteria of it'd be perfectly cool. Then again, my parents are a little bit off, so. But I have to give credit where credit's due. Same here. Moral obligation completed. I go back to bad mouth on them now. <laughs> I actually like Mark Twain's quote. I think it was Mark Twain said that when I was a boy of of 15, my father was an imbecile. When I turned 20, he was a very intelligent man. It, it, it's amazing how much he learned in just five years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cute. I could tell you stories about my father. <laughs> That's, let's save that one for this? another day, my dear. Oh, but yeah. Now, if you guys are saying that your parents were were very open and accepting and that kind of thing. How did they show you they were open and accepting? Like, what kinds of things did your parents do right that you hope that other parents do if they find out that their child isn't starting to investigate paganism as a religion? See, my parents, um, okay. Their view is if you're gay, straight, Catholic, Christian, Protestant, Muslim, Hindu, whatever. It's all good. You're a person. My dad's motto in life is you never know when you're going to meet a friend. He's one of the swellest people you'd ever want to meet. Real laid back. Cool. A mom, a little bit of a sick psycho. But she's still in the same boat of a person's a person. Um... They both had troubles earlier on in their lives that opened their eyes to a lot of things. I won't go into that due to privacy reasons, but for that one thing there, that is one of the best gifts I got from them. That's part of the reason why I look at people today and honestly wonder if I'm a member of their species some days. It's like, okay, you see someone in front of you. Yeah, they're on a different path. That's nice. That's cool. But you can't stand them because they're on that path? What the hell? They could be your best friend in the future. You don't get too many of those. Yeah, it is kind of sad when you see people that have that level of discrimination just because of path instead of looking at the morals that somebody has or what kind of person they are. Well, I got to tell you, as a parent, though, because, you know, I have a, I have a 19-year-old boy. I, I, I do give parents slack on initial freakouts on things. Like, when you initially hear anything, and I don't care what it is, like, it could be something good. As a parent, your initial thing is, if it wasn't already kind of kind of set for their life or something you were thinking they were going to do, your initial thing is to kind of freak out because... Um, you know, these children, they're everything to you. I mean, in a way that I cannot even describe to anyone, um, I would do anything for my son. I mean, anything at all. And if I even think he's doing something that could hurt him or has the potential to hurt him, I mean, like, I'm about going out of my mind insane. And you do. You almost go insane at that time. So, you know, I really <laughs> give parents a lot of slack on that um, initial freak out but then you know what you kind of got to get over that and take your step back and have a more rational rational look at things and that's then where an ice 
start to say, okay, okay, parents, you got to got to come back down to reality here, take a deep breath, and look, look at this. Well, f- advice for the kids out there that are listening? A lot of it's in the presentation. No joke. Amen. Okay. <laughs> really take some time to think this over. Okay? I mean, plan for worst case scenario here, okay? You don't want to walk up to mom after you've watched a dozen horror stories about the evil witches and all that stuff. Say, hey, mom, that's my religion. Okay, it's my... Yeah, it's not, not setting a good stage. Right. <laughs> Take this from somebody who makes making mistakes an <laughs> art form, okay? And if you do do it, please record it, because I would like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you put it up on YouTube, and my email address is <laughs> scurvy, scurvy yeah. at pagancenteredpodcast.com. There you go. <laughs> I'll give it a thumbs up. I'll like it and give it a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I think taking that and running with it and kind of bringing it back with what Kara had mentioned earlier about how to show that you're being supportive. Yeah, scurvy does have a, a, a huge point that it is a lot in presentation. But back to the parent side of things, um, looking at paganism, um, I was having a conversation last night and they were talking about how, you know, compared to mainstream religions, Kara was mentioning too that a lot of the the pagan beliefs are outdated when considered by a lot of the mainstream. So in there's this feeling of looking at the kid saying, I'm going to practice paganism and I'm going to worship Gaia and ha ha ha, you're silly. People don't yep. do that. Really... <laughs> You know, as we said before, even if you don't agree, try not to roll your eyes. Try not to hold back laughter. Try not to outwardly giggle and make them feel dumb. Because as much as you may feel that they're silly, and it may turn out that they're silly, the point is they still feel strongly about this. This is still something that they feel strongly about, especially if you can see that they're a little bit nervous or that they're obviously getting to be a little bit defiant. And the defiant and the anger usually points towards insecure and defense mechanisms more than it points to, oh my God, mom and dad, I hate you. Yeah, it's usually, Go ahead, it's Karen. hurt feelings. It's hurt feelings. Usually when kids are reacting back to you that way, it's because you hurt their feeling. And, um, you know, most people and kids can take some anger directed back at a decision better than they can take belittling or laughter or that type of thing back at them. Because at least if you're a little angry, you're taking it seriously, and they do understand that. And I think kids can understand parents being a little hurt or or a little angry not going overboard but I think they can understand that what they can understand and what what they will have a very hard time getting over is when you laugh at them that's hard for anyone to deal with especially when they're in the teenage years you know back to the hormones they're so chaotic and there's a lot of them, as much as they may seem very confident, a lot of them are still looking for that approval. There's still that level of insecure where, is it okay that I express myself this way? Okay, you gave me the okay, that's okay. How about this? Oh, that's not okay? Okay, how do I fix it? So <laughs> when you do something like laugh at them, a lot of older people, yeah, they can get over it and go, you know, wow, you've been an ass today. But when it comes to a kid, that can be surprisingly devastating. 
that also it means a lot to them sometimes when they're finally coming to tell the parents it's something that is so close to their heart now it may be such a character defining moment when they realize about a certain faith or about something like that you laughing at them they take that to heart for the rest of their lives and it can ruin a family as in the past yeah, it can create a lot of jaded emotions, you know? And if it does get into, like, let's say the kid is reacting badly and really being angry about it. Do not yell with your kid. <laughs> this, is, this should not turn back into a screaming match. I mean, I know that emotions can get riled with any kind of heated discussion or, or passionate discussion where so much is involved. But don't yell back. The kid's already defensive enough. And yes, you may not agree, but again, you're not trying to antagonize the situation. You're not trying to prove who's more right or who's more intelligent or anything like that. It's you want that communication. In the end, whether they're right or wrong, you want that communication still open. And the more, you know, going back to if you laugh and then now if you're yelling back, you're just saying, you're just showing your dominance and saying, you know, what you believe in is dumb and I know better than you. How stupid of you not to listen to me. Do you mean it like that? Maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. The point is how that kid is going to take it back. Or if it doesn't even get to yelling, if they start wearing obnoxiously large pieces of jewelry and have that attitude, well, I can wear what I want. You know, instead of going, my God, get that out of my sight, that's blasphemous, that don't antagonize it, ask them what it means. Ask them why they like that symbol. If they insist on wearing it at a family gathering, just, you know, say, well, can you put it away for now and maybe let Grandma step into it slowly. And I'm not saying hide who you are. But let's take this slowly. Or if they're wearing something large enough that can be substituted for a hubcap on a car, if you see something smaller, ask if they would wear it or buy it for them. Sometimes if they're wearing this big thing, it goes back to the same idea as if they're yelling. They're getting defensive. They're trying to show you that they can be themselves and they want you to accept what they're doing so they're putting it in your face so you accept it. If you buy them a piece of smaller jewelry, sometimes it just catches them so off guard that you've accepted it. They actually respond quite positively. It's kind of cool. Side and jewelry. If, oh, and if sorry. they actually are wearing some jewelry that's big enough to be the hubcap on a car, I'd like a picture of that too. <laughs> yeah, it scares me. But um not dealing with paganism, but um uh guy that I knew, uh I was over at his house and uh I wasn't necessarily friends with him, uh I was friends with his sister, but um he was wearing uh skulls, crossbones, uh I forget what band it is. You see the bumper stickers everywhere. Uh misfits. Oh. Uh, but uh, his mother got on him about uh, the skulls and crossbones, and I'm like, well, the actual history behind that is, yes, it was done by the pirates. Uh, no, it's not an evil symbol, and has actually been used uh, by the Knights Templar and was part of the Knights Templar uh, banner. So that's sort of the history behind it, and she's like, oh, okay. And it's sort of Knowing what's going on and um, either A, um, if they are wearing a symbol, look at the, the history behind it um, or the, the meaning behind it and make sure that your kid also knows what's behind it too. Ask them, have them talk about it. Um, I mean... In truth, even the cross is, it was a pagan symbol at one point in time, uh, used by the Romans. Um, so, 
but now it's the Christian symbol. Um, so that's that's sort of an interesting um, point of view to take. Is uh, you know you have the pentagram, of course, but then you have other sorts of uh, multi-directional stars and the moons, or you know, sun sun things. Uh, so just as a side note. Well, I can I can give you some ideas of because um, we are starting to get um, some people coming to us and asking specifically advice on uh, teens who are wishing to speak to their parents that they are investigating um, different forms of paganism as religion. And also we're starting to get some parents that are now contacting us saying that their children have come to them and they're just looking for a little more information on uh, on paganism and, and you know and it's good that they're taking the time to do that and I, I should preface that to say that I'm chairing the pagan coming out day and that's that's probably why I'm starting to be contacted by people um, you know when we're talking to parents the first thing we tell them is you're the parent you're the adult in this conversation so it's really incumbent upon you to be the adult in this conversation and to continue guiding your child as you've always done so um, the, the thing is to have an open conversation with your child. And we all know as teens, there's some things you just ignore. <laughs> your child is doing them. They're doing some stuff. You know, they're wearing things that you have no clue what's going on, that type of thing. And to some extent, ignoring that is a very good option for parents because they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to try out different things. Um, but the other thing is to just have that conversation with them. Ask the child what they think, what they believe, what they're looking for, and to not come back to them in a judgmental way um, because the best way to guide them is to have the child continuing to rely on them and to come to them and keep that conversation open. On the flip side, when we're talking to teens, you know, yeah, scurvy and, and them, they were saying it exactly right. Presentation is everything. Uh, don't pick a tense time in your family to do this. Uh, come prepared with what questions you think your parent is going to have. If your parent gets angry or is um, dismissive or that type of thing, just give them a little bit of information and then exit the conversation. Revisit it a few days later. Uh, if your parents have a bad reaction to it, well, you know, this is, this is dealing with core beliefs. So kind of ride with that. Don't get mad. Don't get angry or defensive back. Exit the conversation. Come back to it a few days later. Just do it in little bites and try to think of ways that you can relate it to something that they're already familiar with so that it's not so frightening and different and scary. So that's some of the information that we've been giving people. Um, and again, this is not advice to everyone's specific situation. It's just in general. And I think going off of that, too, is bringing the balance back. Um, don't, um, don't be overly nice and overly accepting and let them do what they want and avoid too much. Like, um, let's say they're being really pushy with saying prayers. It's, it can be a good time, like, yes, you don't want to argue, but... If you want to do a, pay, if they want to do a pagan saying grace, okay, well, this is what we do. You can do that, but you still have to do this. Why? Because fair is fair. If you're going to say this in our at our table, then you have to be willing to say this because it's our table. And instilling that they can't push. Just like they don't want you to push, they can't push too. It's a delicate balance and it can be kind of hard and it'll, it'll probably be a trial. But it's, a, it's also a good time to instill some core balances in there. Well, and what you're talking about are questions of respect and mutual respect. Yeah. And that is something that you should always be teaching your child, you know, to teach them to interact in civil society. So, yeah, I mean, and it's not just dealing with paganism, it's, it's dealing with everyone. And, um, you know, teenagers tend to be obnoxious. 
that's their deal. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're pushing outward. So um, just realize that in this, as in everything else they are probably doing, they're probably going to go into it gung-ho and be kind of obnoxious about it. Um, and as parents, bring it back to a level of, of respect and keep it focused on mutual respect. Um, but also realize they're, they're teenagers. And if they're behaving like a teenager, that's normal. If they're behaving outside of the norms, such as they're hurting themselves, they're doing self-destructive activities, that's when a parent needs to be on top of it and be very involved. But you can't be involved and you can't be on top of it if you've shut down those lines of communication. Also, uh, wager your what is a uh, self-destructive action. Um, I know that some parents consider, you know, spending too much time with out of the house with your friends is a destructive action. But actually, stop and sit down and say, "Are these friends okay? Um, is is what they're doing a destructive action?" in general or is it just your personal morals saying is this a destructive action so interesting sorry I'll leave it at that an analogy that I sometimes use is that imagine if there is an empty room and you place a very young child in this room and the and the only other two things in this room are a piece of copper wire and an electrical plug socket. It takes no genius to know that eventually a very bad thing is going to happen. Um, I've seen many people with the mindset that we need to step in now to prevent this horrendous accident from happening because we know already what the consequences will be. And what I've heard from many people is that their parents tell them it isn't about finding your own way. It, 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 it isn't about respect of your teenageness. It's about, if you don't go to church, you will go to hell and you will have eternal damnation. End of. There is no second guess. This, I'm stepping in to save your soul. And they will not hear any, any, anything else because there is no argument against saving the kid's eternal soul. The argument ends there. You can't take it somewhere else. It isn't a, it's beyond a life and death thing. That's the wall I've seen kids encounter. Yeah, and I've I've seen that too. And I'm I don't know of a good way to handle that. Um my response is usually Yes, acknowledge that they're doing it because they care, but leave when you can and hopefully that they'll see whenever you're a an adult that maybe you're doing okay. If not, it's it's their loss, but that's my personal beliefs. Yeah. No, Kara. If 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 my parents came to you with with that question and that concern and their absolute conviction that their concern is legitimate. What would you tell the parent? You know, actually, I have had a parent contact me, and that is one of their concerns. Um, I appreciated the fact that they were able to articulate that to me, knowing that they're articulating it to someone who obviously does not believe that as mm. part of their religion. Um, and they were telling me that their honest concern is this child has been given to them by God for care here on earth. And part of their role as parents, part of their sacred duty is to care for that child, not only on earth, but also to help guide them so that they could reach salvation. And that yeah. is a core belief that they have. And they were honestly very concerned about their child. 
Um, and my advice to them was, you have raised this child. Trust in how you have raised this child. As the child gets older, they may or may not follow your religion. So if you truly have faith in how you have raised this child, and you also have faith in your God, that's where you need to place that trust now. But whatever you do, keep your relationship good between you and your child. Do not drive that child from you, or you will not be able to help them anymore. You will not be able to guide them anymore. Um, you will have failed in what you have now told me is your sacred duty to help guide and protect that child. Um, and we had, uh, you know, an email that, that, that was going back and forth, and then um, we exchanged phone numbers so that, that we could call. It was a very respectful dialogue. But again, it was something they had an extreme concern about. At the end of the dialogue, though, they did see the value in letting their child explore these things, um, different religions, to, to see not so much what was working for the child, but to allow the child to explore, to keep the lines of communication open, to keep that child close to them, and for them to just put their faith in their child whom they love and also to put their faith in, in comes over don't forget it because you might come across it again so no we don't hear as many of the good stories but when we hear them it 
it's good to remind everybody that it can turn out to be good. It can turn out to be really positive. Even if it doesn't seem like that. Oh, yeah. Never give up on family. Never. I mean, you would, you'd, you'd be surprised. I mean, things that can be acrimonious on something one year, it, it, it can always be healed. It can always, always be healed. People can have a change of heart. So never give up on that. You know, and we talked a lot about what to do when your kid's being obnoxious about it and being right in the forefront and trying to shove it down your throat. But there's also the other half. If they are scared to bring it to your attention and you find it out by accident because they've been hiding it. So, yeah, I've seen a lot of the ones where, hey, look at me, pay attention to me, I'm, I'm being my own person. I've also seen the ones that try to hide it as much as possible because they're afraid of reactions. And this is kind of, I feel that this is kind of a double-edged sword because, yes, there are times where they're hiding it because they're, they know that they're doing something that they're not supposed to, but... The main concern that I have is assuming that it, it's something that they feel they're not supposed to do rather than just looking at it as they're afraid you're going to yell at them. They're afraid you're going to disown them. They're afraid that you're going to, to hate them or never let them out of the house again. So if you find a pentacle or a pagan book or, you know, whether it's cleaning your kid's room or laundry or whatever, don't fly off the handle. It's the same thing if they're, they're angry and obnoxious. Don't fly off the handle. If they're hiding it, they're probably scared as it is. You know, maybe bring up a conversation like, oh, I saw this TV show. What did you think of this? Or I had a conversation with Mary up the road and she said that her daughter turned pagan. I don't know what to think about it. And see what they have to say. If you bring up a non-threatening dialogue, it may show them that it's safer than what they think. And again, it goes back to keeping that conversation open. It's, it's not much different than the other kind of situation. Well, it's just something to put out there. And this is true for every moment in life. Well, at least we figure out a way around it. But... Uh, you might want to repeat that, Scurvy. You broke up quite a bit. Alrighty. When... It, when you, uh... Well, this is true for every moment in life, nonetheless, but if you find a pentacle or whatever, and you're approaching your kid about this, you have one moment to do this right. So, try to be somewhat calm, collected. It goes back to my belief, am I going to look like a dummy explaining this later? Please, try not to make hurt feelings for life. Don't give your kid something to tell the therapist. I mean, look at the society they're being raised in. they got enough of that already. But it's every parent's duty to be the one that causes them to go to therapy. My son lists off the ways I'm, I'm doing that to them. So it's kind of your duty. What scares me is the honest sincerity in what she said that with. <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> wow. Oh yeah! Wait, since this is PG thirteen, I can't really. You just gave really me goosebumps. I mean, I'm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna go find my teddy bear now. <laughs> Sometime I'll have to have Justin on the show, and then he can. <laughs> he can scare you all, and you won't camp with me. 
when I was a teenager, my father used to have long talks with me after dinner. Um, I can't really say long talks because he's the one who did all the talking. It was more like a lecture, and I just sat there regrettably listening because I didn't because I wasn't allowed to leave the table until he was done talking. Um, and he would talk to me about all the various things he thought I was doing wrong or things that I could improve upon. He was cons he expressed concern about my lack of drive and lack of potential and things like this, and his concerns about my faith were just rolled into this long list of concerns he had about the ways I was doing all these various aspects of my teenage life. Um, I think, though, that his concern for my faith was less drastic than his concern for my lack of academic potential or academic enthusiasm. He was, after all, a college professor. and Well, was, is. He's not dead. Um, and so he moderated his concern for my faith along with all, all you know, the ways he tried to mold me into a, into a better human being. Now it's a crashing hold. <laughs> cricket, cricket. Thank you. You're welcome. ADD I think, moment. Uh, we need to going make off. My bad. Sorry, mm -hmm. Scurvy, go ahead. Well, I was just on a tangent, but I think we need to make a PCP cricket. <laughs> okay. Sports new assignment. Yeah. <clears throat> I think sort of going off of what Miles had just said, um, I know throughout most of my teenage years, I really didn't speak to my father. Um... Most of them, most of the conversations did not end well. Um, at this point, I still talk to them. Most of our conversations are civil. Uh, I'd say probably 99% of it's civil. Um, but um, I know whenever it comes to, to my faith path, uh, I was always very... Growing up as a teenager, I was very involved with the, the church, um, and I know I've spoken about the podcast uh, a handful of times to my mother, but evangelist he is, and having to show off to everybody around him how great of a Christian he is. Uh, meanwhile, he does have his issues, I'll just leave it at that, um, but... Um, I know that that's one part of one of many parts of my life that I really don't share with my parents. Um, and sometimes I I wish I could. Um, knowing knowing my parents the way that I do, I think a lot of the insight that I've come across would help them in their lives. Um, but I, I know that it's not always the best of things to to talk about um, so I mean there there is that that possibility that <clears throat> whereas you may not agree you may not um, understand etc cetera, etc cetera, um, you can keep a, an open line of conversation about other things and worst case scenario sort of let them do what they need to do as as your children and not necessarily accept that but um, don't use it as something to drive a wedge between you. 
Um, so, you know, I think some of the problem that parents have is what they hear about paganism and then what the reality of the religion is. Those are two very different things. And, you know, I, I would imagine if all, all you heard about X, Y, or Z was some pretty outrageous and pretty negative things, um, and that's all you knew about it, it would be very hard for you to understand why your child was, you know, into something like that and why that would kind of strike the, the fear and panic buttons in parents. Um, but the onus is on parents, again, to look into these things, look a little deeper than just the first blush, um, find out from your child what they think and believe. But parents, you also need to investigate on your own because paganism is this huge umbrella term that can mean a whole lot of different, different religions and very different faith paths underneath it. And so you need to educate yourself on that so that you can interact with your child about it. And, and that would be a, a huge piece of advice that I would give to parents. You need to read up on this, and you need to go to source material, not to sites that are writing about paganism from an outside perspective. Well, like you had brought up earlier, where um, about you being responsible as a parent for raising your child, there is so much that is put on a parent that even through the laws you know you are responsible for your child up to the age of 18 anything they do before that you are responsible for once they turn 18 they're considered adults and they're free to go about their own lives so as far as religion wise you're trying to do the best that you can where the way I was brought up, it was this way, and that was it. However, as I, you know, as the years gone, I have changed my opinion as far as this way is the only way. Why? Because it wasn't to me consistent enough. It was like no, it's the way they presented themselves was this is this is it. This is you know, like the best thing they're supposed to be. And everyone else is just lower than that. All the other religions are lower than that. This is what you're supposed to be. I didn't feel that way. Uh, I didn't want to be a part of that. Being open to your child and teaching them what you have learned, but yet also learning along with them what their interest is but allowing it to be okay to me as a parent, okay, it's, it's like having a, a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they feel that they're so serious. It's like if you're that serious, you can wait. Wait until you're that age where you're able to decide together if, if you mean that much to each other, if this religion means so much to you, then let's, you know, let's learn about it as much as you can and then... It almost puts relief off of the parent when the child becomes of age where they could go, okay, not my problem. But yet I don't feel that, oh, not my problem in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, you have a child that just is out to push your buttons. Yep. <laughs> but um, the fact that if you help them to learn about it and this is what they want and you understand that Amber's dad has always made the comment you all you can do is guide them you can teach them right from wrong and guide them and that's the the best that you can do from then on is the person that they will become they will choose who they want to be what they want to do in life the religion they want to follow, the partner that they want to have, the friends that they want to have. But what you give them to work with will you know, will guide them when they come to make those decisions. But except they 
it may not be what you wanted for them is what, as a parent, I think you need to be able to do is accept that it may not be what you want, but if it's what they want and they're happy, that that would, that would work. But I know that there's so many parents that have that religion that it's, it's, um, Highway the highway kind of thing? Like yeah. That if, um, they don't understand it themselves because this is all they know is their religion. For years, I got a postcard in the mail every Wednesday without fail that the Presbyterian ladies were praying for me. And my mother had them doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you do your parenting and up, up to a point, and then you've got to let your, your child go and develop on their own. And you do have to have faith that you've given them the guidance. And then you also have to have faith in your child that they will then take that guidance and, and do well. I, I think part of what concerns parents um, outside of, of a salvation aspect, you know, looking at, oh, you know, what's going to happen to their soul after they die, is how is this going to help them or not help them while they're alive? And I think some people are under, under the um, mistaken impression that within paganism there's no there's no code of ethics there's no um, moral guidance that can be instilled and you know that's that's something that um, is definitely an incorrect assumption and it's something that uh, if if children can show their parents this is the moral code that I'm following within my religion that does go a long way to, to allying some parental fears over how how will this change my child? You know, I don't want them to be immoral. I don't want them to have problems or get into trouble. Um, but I, I got to tell you, your parenting that you've done and how you're describing it is excellent. You kept your relationship with your children, and yet you're also still maintaining your parental role. And for teens, I'm sorry if this hurts you when you hear it, but when your parents tell you, you can investigate this all you want, you can look into it all you want, but I don't want you going to rituals. I don't want you going out and doing X, Y, and Z. They're your parents, and you need to follow what they say. And if this is something important to you, just like Amber's mom said, when you're an adult, you can more fully pursue it. It's not the end of the world. Suck it up. Deal with it. Have some patience. It will stand you in good stead. Yeah, I think even even as, as the, the child or the teenager, if you want to have that relationship with your parents and, and keep at it, 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 it's patience on both ends. The, the parent being patient enough to learn along with them, the child patient enough to say, okay, if it takes until I'm 18 to, or maybe it won't, maybe, you know, as the parents are learning along with the child, they they accept it more so and say, you know what, okay, I, I see that you really understand this and I understand it more and um, if this is what you decide, then this is fine with us and, you you know, maybe that will work. I, But it's the patience, sitting back, listening uh, on both ends. And I think some of that can be the hormones, because when the hormones are going, whether it's relationships, I don't know how many people I went to school with, and when they were 18, they were convinced that they have found their true love, and this was the end. And then when they get older, they look back and go, hmm, wow, was that dumb. <laughs> what was wrong with me? <laughs> so... I think part of that, you don't understand, this is my world. I think that's kind of normal as much as it is absolutely bottled insanity. That it's easy for us when we get older to go, guys, you have to have that patience. But a lot of times the kids are still going to go, no matter if they are the most perfect kid, Chances are they're still going to go, well, 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 you can be patient, but you don't understand how it feels for me. And, well, as a parent, I think some, it, 
the communication, if you could explain even, uh, well, you might think that I understand, but let me tell you what happened when I was your age. And it could be something that you did that was stupid too, and they, it, they could be totally surprised because why? They would have never expected that from you. But they would see that you went through hormones too and made some stupid decisions back then. But it was a learning process. Well, it's, it's being the parent. You know, I mean, that's part of being the parent is understanding that your, your child as a child is still developing. Even as a teen, their brain's developing. Um, and at that age, they just, they have low impulse control. And it's, it's not a matter of willpower yet. It's parts of their brain that helps you control impulses. Impulsive behavior has not fully developed yet. That's where, as a parent, you have to help guide. And it's a difficult balancing act. And how do you guide your child without smothering them, without taking them seriously? And how do you help them grow into a capable individual that can really blossom and grow and be a productive adult? You know, because that's, that's our job in the end, is to, to make sure that they can have a good life on their own. Um, that's hard. I mean, it's hard. Parents screw that up. Sucks. Screw up. <laughs> it does. It's no fun. No. I mean, that part of the job is no fun, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, um, it's, I, I think there's so many parents that do try to be, to be those perfect parents. You know, their child did nothing wrong, and um, they they go to church every every weekend. You know, uh, and and just the stuff that they do, and the fear of they went wrong if their child does something wrong. The fear I I, I as a parent did something wrong, and and not understanding that we're not perfect either, and that we we learn as we go as parents that it's, it's not like animals where a lot of them uh, there's that nature that kicks in and they just know what to do to take care of their their young ones we're kind of taught which is kind of I actually, I actually wonder this has occurred to me um, we have um, discussed that Teenagers are often at the mercy of their hormones and their development and teen angst and such. Um, and I wonder if parents, I confess I'm not one, are at the mercy of um, social peer pressure in how they raise their kids. Hmm. Well, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, like what would the other, if I can oh. use this over one cliche, what would the other ladies at the church social think if they found out that my daughter was seen wearing a pentagram at the mall? Oh my goodness. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. You know? You know, I think there's some of that, but when you get down to it as a parent... Um, it's way more personal than that. Yes, you might give thought to, oh my God, you know, what if these people see my kid doing whatever? But for the most part, you're you're so worried about doing a good job as a parent, however you define that good job, and you're so worried of screwing this up and screwing your kid up. Um, that's really more of a driving factor in your decision making when it comes to kids I think I, d I don't know what, what do you mm -hmm. think Amber's mom mm -hmm. Plus, I hope the parents aren't that shallow well I think there could be some that are <laughs> that don't don't give a, a horse's patoot you know on what goes on in their child's lives yeah. uh, as long as they're out of their hair um, I don't f feel that um, what I accept as belief 
in God would be acceptable to my parents. But I understand how they feel, but I don't think they understand how I feel. But that's okay. Uh, we basically just don't talk about it. Because the way my parents were brought up, it's you do right or you know where you will end up in hell. Or you will be suffering in purgatory. Because why? Because you didn't do this, you didn't do that. It was more of a fear than embracing the religion and the love of God. It was a fear that was instilled upon them. I don't believe in putting that fear in that if you don't do this religion, you know, when you die, you will go to hell. And I, I believe that most kids would say, what do I care when I die? I won't be here. So, <laughs> you know, do I really care if I'm in hell? Nope. I won't be here. So, <laughs> I don't think that that would even phase them if you even uh, made that approach to them on it. I or just, I mean, go ahead, Mom. Go ahead. A lot of pagan paths, we don't have a hell like that. So as much as somebody will say, well, you're going to hell, a lot of them will go, it's your hell, you go there. We don't have that. Yeah. It's not my problem. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've ever heard a lot of people say, we're living hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still think, <clears throat> every time I get told I'm going to burn in hell, I mean, I have to remind these people that he's been at it for quite a while now. I'm pretty sure he don't burn people anymore. Okay, they're well done every time. Maybe a little bit rare on occasion. You never know. <laughs> but I'm bummed. Funny. <laughs> That's good. He knows when done is, yeah. <laughs> if the knife pulls out and there's no entrails on it, he's done. <laughs> nice. Yikes. <laughs> to take that a little too far, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's good though Joe thank you that's quite right he's done burning people he likes the medium rare that's funny <laughs> I guess, a, I guess a little extra done every once in a while is okay I mean I kind of like my when I grill I kind of like a, I like to know it's been kissed by the fire but I'm sorry did I go there yeah <laughs> I mean, some things that uh, I think it was Kara was talking about, you know, with all of these mainstream um, examples of paganism, what we hear, you know, there are there are bad branches of, or groups of people that claim pagan out there. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you do have to be careful. You know, know that drug use is not necessarily an accepted practice in, in most pagan paths. You know, like, there's the, the Native American church. Yes, they do peyote. Yes, it's a hallucinogen. But it is an intense 24-hour. You stay there. The leader does not do anything. It is a sacred sacrament. It is not to get high and have fun. If you are known to do that, you're not do, allowed. And those churches do peyote about as frequently and to about the, the amount consumed that Catholics consume the holy wafer the, the mm -hmm. one little tiny piece is size of a quarter once a week yeah, mm -hmm. or something with even less yeah it's not like binge drinking right you know a, a good path is not going to want your child or even want somebody that is under legal age to participate in something like that. It's not something where 
you know, us pagans all go out, yeah, we'll joke about partying around the fire, but if you see most of our parties, listen to the Pantheon Pantheacon episode. Oh, my Everybody's God. <laughs> you know, I, I know, that was embarrassing. You're like, oh, give us the party stories. And we're all like, oh, well, we're not, I don't, we didn't go. We're not partiers. Like, we didn't attend any of the parties. <laughs> so, yeah, we kind of burst everyone's bubble that we're, you know, hard, hard drinking, partying kind of people. <laughs> you know, and yes, angst-ridden teens are normal, but embracing that and be and embracing the emotional and, or mentally manipulative aspect is not. Yeah, Having sure. that power... What's that? Sorry, go ahead. I quit here. It's all good. Oh. Well, yeah. I mean, religion is can be used as a power base. I, I mean, we've seen that over and over and over throughout history. There are people out there who understand that religion can be used as a way to have power over people, and they do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they may um, say they're a high priest. They may say they're a pastor. They may say they're a mystic. Um, and it doesn't matter what religion it, it's in. There are cult leaders, and I'm, I'm using that in the modern terminology, not, not the old terminology of cultists, um, that are looking at being a predator and this is just the veneer, the face they're going to wear to make it easier to find prey and to make it um, harder for, for social conventions to come down on them. So, yeah, you have to, no matter what religion it is or what type of group it is, there's, there's things to watch out for, protect your child from, protect yourself from. So you absolutely have to look at that. My train of thought just went kapsh, for some can reason. The, can the um, can squirt respond? Hmm? In the textbook I wrote um, early on, I have one chapter of what is witchcraft, but in that there's one section of what is witchcraft not, in which there's a list of all the things that people hear about all the horrors of witchcraft that are quite simply untrue. It's not Satanism and evil worship. It's not a big drug, naked orgy fest thing. It's not going to send you to hell. All these gross misconceptions which people use as fear tools are quite simply untrue. Yeah. Um, there may well be some, and this is a term I've heard frequently, some, <clears throat> um, some pagan covens that go into it just for the drug use and the, the making orgies and things, and that is the reason that they call it witchcraft, although legitimate and Honest pagans will do whatever damage control they have to do to keep those stories and those ludicrous notions to the minimum. Yeah, and even when looking at the devil worship, I mean, yes, there are satanic paths, but really, we've met some really awesome Setian people and a few Satanists, and they're actually really awesome. It has nothing to do with, you know, if the child is, is being arrogant and disrespectful and, you know, horrible little monsters, then chances are it doesn't matter what path they're calling it, it's not a healthy thing. You know, if they're sacrificing animals, this, this is not what those paths even do. The funny thing is, is... Left-hand path is very different than devil worship. The devil is a Christian being, is a Christian part of that, that deity system. And so actual devil worship is more Christian than paganism. So, 
I mean, left-hand path is very, very different than the quote-unquote old, old devil worship where, you know, people are summoning the devil and demons and stuff like that. It's it's more of a look of, at things around you and it, it's more of a um, way of living your life more than the idea of evil things. So. Yeah, and usually if they're going into the negative things like that, usually that's more of an emotional imbalance and points to something wrong. You know, like even the use of animal parts. Yeah, there are a lot of paths that use animal parts. But those animal parts are not, you go out and, and kill an animal and dismember it and take home parts. It is very respectful. You're taught that you meditate. You have communication with the spirit of that animal. It's an amazingly respectful process. And if they are not being respectful when they are handed a bone or a tooth or anything like that, it's a bad thing. No matter what path they're claiming, that's a sign of mental instability or imbalance, not necessarily leaning back on paganism. And that can be hard because of, you know, like Brandon was saying, that as soon as you hear left-hand path or Satanism, everybody gets their hackles in a raise, whether they're Christian or whether they're Wiccan. Brandon, but it... Go ahead, Just to clarify, for those who might wonder, what then, in your interpretation, is the difference between the left-hand path and Satanism? Brennan? Um, that was a question. I'm thinking, well, Satanism and left-hand path are pretty much the same, but straight-up devil worship. Um, there's, there's stories, um, actually even Satanism, some degrees. Uh, you have things like the Temple of Seth that is left-hand path that is not necessarily Satanism. Um... But um, you see the the old school movies, or even the the funny movies of um, people trying to summon demons and stuff like that, and that's that's more of a a devil worship, getting into still doing dealing mainly with Christian deities or uh, the deity system, uh, the angels, the demons, the fallen angels. Um, certain things like that, and the temple was set is uh, going more back towards the the Kia Kios, Solomon, and um, e, you know towards that that time, Egyptian, so on and so forth. Uh, the religions that were around during Moses's time, but not necessarily Judaism. Um. And also another side note, um, the idea of kosher meats and um, the festivals of Jewish holidays, Christianity branched off of Judaism, Jesus was a Jew, um, there was animal sacrifice there. Um, I know even I got into a conversation the other day with um, one of my co-workers about... Um, Cain and Abel, um, Cain, Abel had given a sacrifice to God dealing with meat, and Abel had given berries and honey and stuff like that as his sacrifice, and God liked the, um, the sacrifice of meat over, or of blood over top of that of the berries and honey and so on and so forth. So, I mean... Even if you look, there are some practices such as Voodoo that does deal with animal sacrifices. Um, there are a lot of religions that are very close, that are intertwined, that deal with animal sacrifices. And 
I think going back to the the idea that are if there is animal sacrifices involved, are they torturing the neighborhood cats or are they seriously doing what they're supposed to do in a respectful manner and and um, not looking to to just be a deviant. Um, so that's sort of an that's not necessarily for a, a more of a teenage thing, but uh, looking at what they do in their younger adult age, um, which at the same time they're depending on where you're at. Um, Voodoo is uh, in some cultures a prevalent um, entity or however you want to put it um, so there's there's other things going on but uh, just a weird side note for me so did I sort of answer your question Miles uh, well I'm uh, not uh, an expert no. <laughs> that's okay Sorry. it rambled a good bit um, I no, I think I was actually playing, ironically, to turn this the definition on itself, I was playing devil's advocate. Um, if I was a Christian parent of a child who expresses an interest in paganism, and I hear someone talking about the left-hand path of witchcraft, and um, I ask someone who claims to be pagan, who cannot give me a definitive answer about what's the difference between left-hand path, devil worship, and paganism, I think all that's going to do is make me a bit more confused and a bit more suspicious that maybe what my child is ending into is as nefarious as I had been led to believe and had concerns about. Ah. Uh. Left-hand um, path for dummies. If somebody asks you what the left-hand path is, you just tell them it's yeah. self-improvement like a religion. <laughs> yeah. It's close enough. You know what? That, that's kind of true. Close um, self-improvement like a religion. Okay. Except you're being a wee-wee head about it while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I go there? Um, well, the... If... I actually asked all of that because I was... I need to see if someone can offer a a definition or a clarification of a kind I was trying to find. So yes, I was actually fishing for answers. Um, in that the difference between left-hand path of witchcraft and Satanism and devil worship, as I understand them, are that left-hand path of witchcraft implies that the Wiccan rule of harm none does not necessarily apply. It's not that you can cast spells and do circles and worship Gaia and all these things, but no one gets hurt. It is that if something needs doing, you do what needs to be done, even if it requires that someone might get hurt in the process. Um, a contemporary example of that might be that um, um, Gaddafi could have chosen to negotiate with the rebels and with the other Arab nations, he could have sat down to a conference table, but instead he chose to take the hard-handed approach and bomb his own people. That might be considered a left-hand path. He, he chose a way to, to exercise his force, and yes, people will get hurt, but he thinks his actions are justified. That, that's a left-hand path-ish analysis to a contemporary um, event. Um, Devil worship, as I understand it, um, devil worship and demon worship, to me, are more or less interchangeable, but that's because I interpret the word devil from the Sanskrit devi, D-E-V-I, meaning 
unseen spirit. So devil worship is the worship or veneration or interaction with unseen spirits, which may or may not be benevolent. They might be evil little imps and things that want to burn a house and poison a cat, or they might be useful spirits like like um, household um, oh crack, what's the word? It's Celtic. Something. Um, and then Satanism, in my definition, is itself the worship of Satan, quite simply that, in that he is the a fallen angel who was cast out from heaven, and since he is a fallen angel from heaven, then he is part of the Christian mythology, and therefore he is exempt from paganism, and and it's wrong to call witches and pagans Satanists because Satan is part of the Christian pantheon. Okay, lecture done. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> in, the same, in the same breath, though, um, Satan uh-huh. has, has roots, or some of the names of Satan, has, has roots in other paths. So, you can't say he's, he's all the Christian's fault in. Yeah, like, as soon as you make a, make a statement about all of paganism, you're absolutely wrong. I'm just... I just wanted to put that out there. Occasionally, <laughs> I, I like to uh, look at the bad, the uh, well, air quotes bad guys of any any uh, path, and um, picture it to see if they just got a bad rap. Sometimes it's a little bit surprising. I mean, okay. there's a, a never-ending battle between is Satanism pagan. Um, you have some some people who claim the path Satanism that say it has nothing to do with that. We've just kept the name for shock value because that's what we do. You have other ones that say, no, we worship the Christian devil. So it's it's split not only in what we view it as, but what they view it as, and it's this horrible mess. So... Yeah. In a way, it's like herding metaphysical cats. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Well, and it just somewhat bring this conversation back to um, what to do if your if your child is a pagan or more as a child to say, yeah. you know, I, I'm I'm investigating this religion, and this is not to say to hide things, but if you are a teenager or if you are an adult and you are having this conversation with someone, um, you know. Bringing a level of detail into saying, oh, well, not I'm a pagan. Well, I'm not just a pagan, I'm a witch. Well, I'm not just a witch, I'm a left-hand path witch. That's probably more than they're going to be able to process. And that's also right. what I like to call freaking the mundane. Um, <laughs> you, you, you're, yes. That, it's that's fun. not the way to do it. Oh, it's funny. Unless you're then on the receiving end of all the crap that's going to roll downhill on you. Um but that's probably not the level of, of detail in the initial conversation. Now, if those are, are paths that you're following, that's something to follow up in later conversations after you've kind of fleshed out this commonality of I'm a pagan and giving a little bit of information. Like if having a discussion, you know, if, if I were to have a discussion with someone about my religion and it's Helena's most, you know, I, I don't go into all the detail about it. I'm going to give them a bite-sized piece about it and say, well, in, in form, it's like the Catholic religion. You, you know, if you went to, a, like, a worship service, you would be able to follow along pretty well because it, it follows along like a, like a Catholic service. However, it's also, like, kind of crossing it with the polytheism that's in the Hindu religion. And those are things that people can relate to. So rather than going into the detail that we all like to go into, um, that's not something I would advise people to do in the first yeah. couple initial conversations. Well, you could just 
tell them to pretend that all their saints were other gods and stuff. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well... Who's right? No, he's... Hunting I'm gonna... Baby steps first. Put a little PSA out there for the kiddies. Um, on the off chance that you're experimenting with other religions and stuff that are not Christian... Maybe you want to spend just a little bit of time rehearsing what you're going to say to mom and dad. You know what I mean? Yeah, it comes back to presentation, but it also comes back to if you can't speak intelligently about a decision, well, if you don't know enough to speak intelligently about a decision... Morally, I might honestly have to back your parents. I mean, that's if you. Yeah. Then if you're, are you you're, there if you're, yet? If you're going off the beaten path and all that stuff, I mean, hey, that's, that requires a little bit of work. I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I'm a little bit biased here. I'm <laughs> rooting again. I'm not rooting for the home team here, but I got to give credit where credit's due. So please do your oh, homework. Hmm. Don't also, make me look like you... a dummy. <laughs> Also, if you are worshiping, if your child is worshiping uh, Harry Potter, or let's say uh, somebody off of a video game or an anime, uh, you you might have to uh, yeah. wonder what's going on. <laughs> Did you, you just you had to pull an eighty six? It was relevant, but you had to pull an eighty six. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he he did. did. Can we go one episode without mentioning eighty six? Oh, <laughs> oh, never no. mind. <laughs> but I mean, Brennan does bring up a good point about stability, and Scurvy does too. I mean, it, it's hard for kids that age. You know, Kara had touched on it before about the, the the biological development. It's hard for them to introspect to that degree most of the time. But. You know, like Scurvy was saying to the kids, if the only reason that somebody is doing something is because it's not what their parents are doing, that's a problem. You know, it points to issues that are much bigger than what the path is called or that they're disagreeing. It points to deeper communication issues, deeper relationship issues, and maybe something else with them. You know, am I saying that anybody that says, oh, I'm left-hand path or I'm Setian or, or I practice witchcraft has some mental instability? Eh, I think we're all a little bit nuts, but no, not to that extreme. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Cool. I think one of the things that scares parents and gives them a bad idea is all of the unstable kids out there who don't really know what they're doing. The ones who wear the hubcap size pentagrams or what have you. Um, the ones who have no idea what they're doing and they're doing potentially dangerous things, like calling upon things without really understanding what they're doing. Um, in response to scurvy, you're a wee head too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that just makes the parents nervous because they're afraid their kids are going to be doing all of these rituals um, and just falling in with the wrong crowd that doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. I have a question for, Am I have a question ahead, for Amber's mom. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, hmm? What, uh -oh. I said, um, I said, uh oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you were younger and exploring faith, what deviations from your from your from your parents' faith practice did you look for, explore, or find yourselves in, and were they concerned about it, and and how did you talk about it? When I was growing up, we just, this is what you did. You, when, you, when you were Catholic, 
every Sunday you went to church, every um, holiday you you had the services, you had the ashes, the blessing of the throat. You just went and you did all this. You went to confession. You did all this. Um, mm-hmm. As as I, it was probably once I started having children, and I sat back and kind of viewed the Catholic where we started out with a Catholic school. Why? Because I went to a Catholic school. That was what you did. Yeah. You learned a lot of your religion in the Catholic school. Okay, we'll continue with that. But it wasn't consistent for me. And I didn't understand why. I uh, didn't care for that. Some of the way that um, I look back on how my parent, well, you know, how my parents kind of feared what would happen to you if you didn't do certain things, if you didn't go to church, you know, where your soul will end up. I didn't have that fear. I had the feel of God loved you. If you treated everyone with respect along with yourself, you were a good person out there. I don't feel that God would look down upon you because you didn't do, you didn't go to church. Um, I remember growing up that they, we had a neighbor that went to church every weekend, you know, every Sunday. But I tell you what, he was the meanest son of a gun in the neighborhood. So does that mean because you went to church that you can behave and treat people like you do, but because you go to church that makes a difference? And to me that didn't. It was if you were a good person all around. Um, I feel people have faith in who they want to have faith in, if that's what they need to make them comforted in times of, you know, when they need somebody. If you need to go and, and pray in church, if that's what you need, then that's good for you. Uh, if you need to pray to whoever, and, and this gives you comfort and, and helps to guide you to, to make your decisions when you hit rough times, then that is fine. But I don't feel that you have, this is what you have to do, and if you don't. And I guess I just became, um, I can't say that I'm actually Catholic, <laughs> but I, I do believe in God. But I also don't condemn, you know, condemn other people's belief in who they believe in. Okay. This doesn't sound good. What do you mean it doesn't okay. sound good? It got too quiet. Oh, Everyone's sorry. going like, "Boy, man." Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just... No, it's cool. We're we're grooving on the wisdom. Absorbed. That's where all the gray hairs came from. <laughs> <laughs> couple of us, couple of us know enough to keep know to uh, pause a little bit because we've had to listen to our own stupidity numerous times. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry, Amber. It's okay. Now, um, going off of what Miles said, have you had to explain? Because um, I kind of made the pagan shift pretty hard. Did you have to explain to the family at all, and how did you handle that with the family, or do did you handle it? They don't, I don't really, they don't bring it up, I don't bring it up. Um, they could have said, oh, so I saw this on, but I don't get feedback. I don't directly get feedback. I get feedback through the grapevine. Hmm. I saw so-and-so's uh, comment on Facebook, or, oh, did you know that? Yeah, and oh, I just one of them. Yeah, 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 and I love yeah, and <laughs> like I don't have a problem. Do you I have a whole? Like, <laughs> I have uh, a whole blog about yeah, and uh, but they don't. Apathy. They don't directly address it to me, um, probably because they wouldn't really. Like what I had to say, I guess. Cool. But that's okay with me. 
So. Yeah, my mom gets that too. She's, you know, Facebook connects everyone now. Um, and so a good portion of our family is on there and, and my mom's on there and all that kind of stuff. And, and I know they uh, ask my mom things about, um, I saw this link that she put up or I saw this thing that she wrote on there or she, you know, put a, a link to a blog post or, you know, those types of things. And, um, you know, I, kn I know my mom is not thrilled with my choice of, of religions. Um, definitely not thrilled. However, she loves me. She absolutely loves me. And I know that despite her reservations, I'm sure, you know, the response that she's giving them is, is pretty much along the lines of what you're saying is, yeah, and what are you going to make of it? That's my daughter. I love her. What do you have to say about it? You know, <laughs> because she is my mother. She, you know, and we, we have that bond no matter what, no matter what. Which, which is great. Uh, I could hear my uh, mother going, well, we'll pray for her. Oh, oh heck yeah. I can rush not do that. And I would be, yeah. okay. <laughs> if you feel you need oh. to, well, that's good, and thank you. Um, <laughs> but I'm content on the decisions that she has made in her life. Um, we both made mistakes as, as growing up, as child and parent. But to know that uh, we can talk about a lot of things. Whether it be religion, personal life, work. And uh, if you look at back at how things were before, you wouldn't have thought that to happen. So I think it's we both matured and and learned a lot that if you really want to keep keep uh, that communication with your child, then you have to learn to accept their decisions, and that's that they're they're not here to be your life. They're there to be to make their own life for them, so to accept that. What, you mean you're not supposed to live for your children? Oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's just crazy talk. <laughs> but it, it's a big fear, I know, with a lot of parents, because even even with the kids dealing with the peer pressure in the school from kids on other things, the peer pressure that they have with kids their own age, the parents, like you said before, going through the peer pressure of the church and your neighborhood, it would be like spotting your child wearing something and all of a sudden everyone's hiding their pets <laughs> because they don't understand. Yeah. You may not either if you're not communicating with your child. But I think to learn both as, as they're growing, to give them that opportunity. Okay, there's so much that your, your body's going through, through these high school years, through the, through the teenage years, that to make a big decision like this, you should take some time but learn what you can about it. You have to decide afterwards this is what you want, then that's good. But to learn, you don't just jump in not knowing what you're getting into in anything. But that's how I kind of feel right now. Five minutes from now, eh, we'll talk. Maybe it'll be different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get off and I'll talk. I'll tell Squirt. Uh, now, just forget everything I said, okay? <laughs> Well, you weren't I really mentioned listening earlier, to you. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that my father um, used to call me up on Christmas morning to 
um, to read me for not going to church. But he's um, surprised me last year when we were talking about faith and religion and comparing Christianity and witchcraft and such. And he and he mentioned that he knows that the creation myth is just that. It's a myth. It's made up. He knows that humans evolved from Australopithecus, which evolved from, from tree shrews, which evolved from fish and all the way back. Um, he knows that Christianity itself is derived from older Mediterranean region religions. He knows that it's based on older Anglican customs. He gets all of that. He knows that Christianity is a new religion. It's only like 2,000 years old. But his choice is to... But his choice, knowing all of that as a skeptic, is still to be a Christian because that's where he finds his answers of faith. And actually, that... It was almost a confession from him that, yeah, okay, I get it, you know, um, amazed me. And that, and that opened my eyes as well to his vulnerability as much as his skeptical nature has always been. I think that when we're kids we go through that feeling of and um, there was a movie quote once that says you know in the eyes of a child mother is God and yeah. I think that that's very true the child looks at the parent and they don't understand that mommy and daddy have flaws just like your classmates do There, there's no acceptance of that they can see that you may make a mistake and you may accidentally cut yourself or bump into something and they understand on that level that you're human but it gets to yeah. mommy and daddy's perfect and that yeah. can be hard go ahead scarf yeah but that changes when your dad cuts his finger off with a skill saw which is I'm sorry <laughs> That was my dad's favorite expression to us growing up. Careful, you're going to cut your finger off. Okay, it didn't matter. I could be doing my homework with a pencil. Careful, you're going to cut your finger off. What's my dad do? Cuts his finger off with a skill saw. Nice. But I think there's still a difference between physical harm and emotional. Yeah, you have the extremes, but... Um, you don't see your parents as fully people. You see them as these higher beings that you don't know if you will ever live up to and be able to have a, a conversation with. And when you, you grow up, you look and go, they made emotional mistakes just like I did. And you start to see them as people rather than these glorified caretakers that maybe have all the answers and don't understand you because they're these higher up people. You know? Right. Yeah. And mommy and daddy can fix anything. He yeah. Can. I mean, that's that's what we kind of thought when we were growing up. If you needed something, yes. you could turn to, to mom or dad and they, they had the answer. They knew how to fix things. When you... He's years old, your dad has a big S on his chest, and he's from Krypton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's... Knowing that you can take it a step farther, and, you know, I th Mom, I think it was you that said, but parents have a huge responsibility... You know, looking at how Decent you're reacting. <laughs> That's my
my goal as a kid, remember? <laughs> when you're talking about to your child about something that you feel is uncomfortable, you are giving them examples of how to handle future confrontation. And that is a huge burden, but it's their brain is still developing. They're still learning that. And the more positive examples you can give, whether it's teaching them when it is okay to spread your wings and be proud of who you are and when to kind of not necessarily hide who you are, but kind of tuck them away and be polite. When to do that, when it is okay for each situation. How to talk to somebody when you don't agree. You're teaching them wonderful communication skills as well as keeping that relationship with your child. That was awesome, this. Matthew. It was really good. <laughs> wondering if that just... was directed towards me in particular or just in general. <laughs> no, I don't just know, in general. But it was making me rethink a few things in my life. Wow, I'm I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Scooby. It all makes sense now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so okay. I know I had touched on it. Go ahead, Miles. I have a question for Amber's mom. Oh, just no. because he's in the hot seat and and this is fun. <laughs> um, if Amber's mom's grandkids came up to her and said, Mom's a whack job. I want to go to church. What would you say? If my grandkids said that their mom was a whack job and they wanted to go to church, yeah, what are you gonna have yeah, because yeah, uh, Squirt just says, since when am I going to have grandkids? Yes, I was informed that I probably <laughs> well, won't have. Okay, any, hypothetical. So, you know, can we change the question? Let's see. Um, <laughs> okay, meow 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 meow. Probably, but. I would probably talk to my daughter about the situation that you know. They want to, and it, it would be in the sense of giving you, I wouldn't want to do it without their consent. It wouldn't be something that, that I would say, well, they want to do this, so let's just go ahead and do it. I don't care if your mom or dad doesn't want it. This is what you want. Yeah. I would probably talk to, to both, you know, if they're, you know, a couple or whatever. I would talk to both of them and ex express that, that there is an interest that they want to do that. Did they have a problem of them simply going? It wouldn't be where I would be forcing it down their throat, trying to convert them to whatever they were, you know, from something that they were to uh, going to church. I wouldn't be doing that. But if the child has that interest, I, I just don't feel that it's my part as a grandmother. Oh, gosh to do that it would it's they they're the parent and and how they choose to raise their child is their choice yeah i think everyone just hung up on me <laughs> <laughs> no everybody's still there the icons are all there <laughs> it's called post scurvy silence i make it a lot <laughs> Amber's mom generates post scurvy silence. Well done. <laughs> it's an accomplishment. Especially with this group. Nobody's mouth here ever shuts up. Be <laughs> true. Hey. Go on back a little bit. Say, hmm? Go ahead, Miles. Is that? No, I'm just I need to observe that I think that Amber has raised a really cool mom. Well done. 
<laughs> Thank you for Amber. <laughs> Thank you, Miles. If I could go back a little bit, um, Kara had mentioned this is going to try to tie um, Squirt's comment in with uh, what Kara had talked about earlier. And she said, there's so many different paths out there that encourage mutual learning. Um, Christina had mentioned about there's so many out there that are doing these crazy rituals and not knowing what's going on. If you're learning with them, there's less of an instance that's going to be, oh my god, what are you doing? Because you're going to have that opportunity where you're, okay, what are you doing? Explain this to me. Let's see if I can understand. Uh, it is not an unreasonable request to be there for one of their rituals. You know, if, um, if the child's learning about, uh, from a bunch of children, this is even more of a reason why you may want to research things, not only from the books your kids give you that they're reading, but from other resources, whether it's from the New Age section in Borders, or whether it's from the Anthropology section on what they used to do, and getting a, a full, well-rounded view, because, well, kids are kind of crazy. We don't want to entrust them all to themselves. Or you can email us. We can give you all sorts of references to check out at a minimal price. <laughs> well, we do have, uh, when Dave comes back, he can give all the details. We do have the Amazon account that has a lot of the books that we've read and rated and what we would recommend to other people, whether it's specific paths or just in general. So we can put that in the show notes. Um, yeah. Knowing somebody that is in a, a certain path, and you know them as a person, but you may not know their religion. Maybe it was something that's not discussed, but if, if you find that they're, you're, you're comfortable with this person, and, and you find out that they are, it, it poss I think learning something from one that you know how do I want to say, yeah. that you could trust, there's, I understand that there's enough of books out there on so many different things that which one is the right book, now just because you said this book and this one said that book, okay, which one's the right book, you're going to, not, not directing it directly to you guys in general, it's just to anybody where it says, well my, you know, you, got, you should read this book and you should read this book, well what's the difference you know, where is it written that this book's the right one and this one's the wrong one? It's it's not. So there is a lot to learn that uh, not to jump in. And I think if you do, if you can't have contact with somebody or refer somebody, almost like there's somebody up in this area or somebody over where you live, um, you just might want to go and talk to them, or if they have any, if you have any questions, or and sometimes getting that right person to talk and answer your questions might put everybody at ease as far as what they're getting into. Can I respond about the books? No. It's going to say a little bit. A little bit of it. It's, a little bit of it is common sense. Like you look at someone um, in their religious section, and there is necromancy. And you kind of know that you shouldn't be poking at dead spirits, especially if you don't want to be poked at. Um, I think one of the best things is to look at Israel Agardi, because his is kind of, from what I've read at least, it's kind of conceptual. You can apply it to different paths, and so it'll give you a bit of a wider view and better understanding. We'll agree to a point, but at the same time, it's all in specific paths. And 
this is where books get really difficult is because there are so many paths out there. I, I doubt a heathen would say, go read Israel Regardi. He'll say, Israel Regardi is a bunch of hermetic crap. This is the book you want to read. Um, so that's what I meant when, when you're looking to possibly read up on the paths there are um, and just understanding that there's just so much out there that the confusion of, okay, well, this is what I read. No, this is, you know, no, this, it says this. But then, of course, you could, you know, oh, well, no, but if you read this book, this book would tell you this. Yeah, well, how do I know which one is the right one and the wrong one? Where, I guess, if you look at other religions, it's kind of like, oh, the Bible, there you go. It's not like, well, no, you have to read this one that says this. It's the Bible. So... You can still relate it to, if you look at different Christian paths, um, you can use the example of the Westboro Baptists, the crazy people that protest in front of soldiers' funerals. Okay. It's well known because most people have interactions with the mainstream Christian religions that those people are not your typical Baptist. They're full of anger and rage and are full of crazy that it's easy enough to say, well, they're a bad example. <laughs> Unfortunately, because paganism is still, I'm not going to say developing because while it is, there's still enough of it out there that's easy for a pagan to go, no, no, they're full of crazy. I think it's, sorry. it's the same thing as if you go to different churches, if you go to a Lutheran versus a Baptist versus a Catholic versus a Roman, you know, conventional Roman Catholic to liberal Catholic to Southern Baptist... Each one, even though it's the same book, will interpret it completely different in some areas. You have ones that are very similar where it's you have to love your neighbor. Some of them will say, yes, you have to evangelize. Some of them will say, no, that you don't. And you can kind of relate that way, whereas... They all have their differences. The pagan paths are kind of the same way, and it's it can be an individualistic. If it's something that is unhealthy, like uh, if you know, going back to the animal sacrifice, if they're saying, "Well, you have to use animals," or even more so, um, blood, like the some of the heathen, heathen or the Ozatru will make a little bit of blood into their runes. And it's considered, you know, part of you. But if they're saying you have to use blood for everything, and that's very damaging. It's obvious that this is not okay. This isn't safe. I would look more for what's safe and healthy as compared to little differences. So it's it's kind of using that internal BS filter that if you're reading something and it's telling you that you are going to command everything around you because you are the almighty power of the universe and you can... Well, that's not exactly the belief that you want somebody to have. If they're telling you that this is what you do to manipulate everybody into doing what you want to and how to harm other people, well, that's, that's an unsafe practice. If they're encouraging, you know, oh, well, just believe and everything will work. Believe, if you have faith that you won't get pregnant, it's okay to have not safe sex because your goddess will protect you. Well, that's silliness and unsafe. 
look out for the, those things that point more towards an unhealthy practice than picking on little differences. And I think Amber actually told me this, but if you're going to look at learning about the different gods and things, mythology is probably going to be better than a religious text on it. It'll be a little more honest. And you can look at the mythology and you can see the good and the bad. You're not going to have people that are going, Isis is a loving mother and she's awesome. And Loki, he's just misunderstood. And you're not going to have that. You're going to have a little bit truer of Mormon mythology. <laughs> See, I teach her well. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, look at anthropology. Look at, look at history, not just New Age. So... Yeah, and it really oh, goes back agers. to that mutual learning. Go ahead, Scarby, what? Oh, New Agers. Yeah. I say we cover them in glitter. Instead of tar and feather, glue and glitter. Um, um, That um, makes them more evil, though. Sorry. Earth's fate. <laughs> Come on, it'll be fun. It'll make them easier to spot. <laughs> the only problem with that is once you deal with glitter you yourself get covered in it so you're giving yourself the same punishment no, no, I'm used to dealing with really toxic chemicals I'm, I'm good at not getting, getting uh, cross contamination on myself and all that so speaking of toxic things y'all some of the things that these kids are learning may not be the best things and they may not be right at all either you gotta check where these guys are getting their information when they're learning about paganism too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So things like them saying, "Oh, we have to have sex with you before you can come into this group." Uh, no. You know, it goes right back into: Is it healthy? If you take it out of the religious context. Let's say there's a sportsman's group. And the sportsman's group says, Well, you have to sleep with me before we allow you in. Is that normal? No. So therefore, it wouldn't be okay in religion. You know? Be familiar with what makes a cult following. You know, if if your child is learning from an adult, be careful. You know, most pagan groups are not going to want children unless the parents are involved. They want the parents to be involved. They want to make sure that the kids are learning good um, good values and good practices about not only their faith, but themselves. They want them to be happy and healthy and in a loving relationship as much as they can be. A good pagan group is not going to say, well, just hide it from your parents. We won't tell them. You know, it's, That's it's not going to... Healthy. Go ahead, Scarby. That yeah. is not healthy. Um, here's my view on this, and this is... Um, speak more to the pagan groups you want their parents there for your protection understand that if their parent makes the accusation accusation and you bunch of insert miscellaneous pagan group here goes in front of a jury of your peer which if you go by the odds, you might have one wearing a pentacle, but probably not. Well. I just let the rest up to your imagination. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're not really 
this pop culture reference, creeping in your windows and snatching your people up. We have enough people to deal with. We're not looking to <laughs> to gather minions. Because minions take way too much time and effort, and most of us have way too many things on our plates and normal lives to deal with little ones. We really don't want the responsibility to deal with everything that is going to happen. And the intelligent in those of us know that. So it's... If you have somebody that is trying to coerce, that's a bad thing. Wait. Yeah, anybody that claims or is trying to convince your child that they can fix all of your child's problems, or if you, your child comes and says, well, this religion is awesome because it can make me healthy and it can, I can grant my wishes and these do everything that I say and it can fix everything. That's not what paganism's about. It's about introspection. It's about learning. It's about questioning things. It's about trying to understand the world around you. It's not fixing everything and making it happy. It's not turning the world into this magical fairyland. It should have realism. It may be a little weird, especially if you're used to mainstream, but it's realism. It's not hiding the fact that pain happens. It's acknowledging it just like anybody, most any other path, acknowledging it and trying to learn how to move past it in a healthy way. Well, here's what I like from the uh, chat room. As Saturn said, if you're getting everything you want, you're screwed. But let's be real. I, I from all the pagans I've met, I love you folks. Sometimes I love to hate you folks, but I love you folks. I'm sorry, did I go there? <laughs> we love you too. Not my love. And I say this politely. In general, if you're leaving your own faith path to go to paganism, you're you're in for a world of suck for a while. I've watched this before, and I I, I find it amusing to watch because people will go, they get into it, and then after a while they'll be like, but, but over there, and then they'll have all the conflict and stuff. And I, personally, I think it's amusing, but it's, you're in for a ride as. But as far as that goes as well, most pagan paths, they expect stuff from you. You gotta do all sorts of fun stuffs, and that's... Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just totally losing my ability to speak here, Amber. That's all right. <laughs> we, we've been going on for a while. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on sport. Okay. She's not here to defend herself. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's all sport's fault. <laughs> but I th wouldn't you think that any religion, though, that there are things that you're expected to that you have to do or are expected to do? A lot of Christians, and I'm, I'm not trying to Christian bash, but a lot of Christians use the heuristic, Jesus forgives me so I can do whatever I want. And to an extent, those are people, small minority given the vast majority a bad name. Um, first time I heard that was a, a lady sold us a dog that she knew had rabies. When we were, I think I was about like first grade. 
Uh, that's why I'm afraid of needles now, actually. But, uh, my mom confronted the lady about that, and, um, that was her, uh, justifier. Most pagan paths have significantly more self-accountability. And it's to use the generic term in the Western sense, it's a lot of it's karma, the whole boomerang effect. What you send out comes back to you. I know I'm going to get some hate mail. Please remember my email address, everybody, at scurvy at pagancenteredpodcast.com. Okay? But, uh... <clears throat> And I think I'm going to be done rambling for a little bit there. Okay. Because this silence is really intimidating. Isn't it? I know. I'm used to having to, like, fight people to speak and all that. I mean, it's... Maybe it's a good thing that whatever is said doesn't seem to be a big controversy against everybody. Yeah. Agreeing, there's... Oh, there's a... There's a lot of uh, agree to disagree in here. Uh, that's, I mean, Barrett, you're here, right? Here. Yep. I'm here. I mean, let's let's just just for sake of argument, what's your uh, thoughts on worldview? What? What are your thoughts on the uh, Wiccan worldview? Uh, as a heathen, depends on which one you're talking about. Exactly. Quite a few. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I know Amanda's there and whole. I think there's a wedding thing. Um, at least I think that's the hint that was given. But uh, is Dave here? Dave's yes, in the am. other room listening. Oh, there he is! Yay! Hey, Dave, what's your uh, worldview on as a wick and on the left hand path? As a left hand path wicked, I am uh, disqualified <laughs> from answering that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's man. We need to fight a little bit more. What the hell? Why do we need to fight though? Like these are basic common sense things. Oh yeah. And acceptance things, you know. More people need to be accepting. Going, you know what? I don't. I think you're a cool guy. I don't care what you believe. I just think you're cool. You know, I don't want to fight with you. You believe what you believe. I'll believe what I believe. Life's good. See, that one works of, for me. One of our good friends is entering the um, is entering the priesthood. He's going to become a, a Catholic priest. And he still thinks we're cool, and he knows straight up what we are. He watched the movie The Right. His biggest issue was how much technology there was. Hmm. Biggest issue. A nun was using a computer. Nice. <laughs> you see? And that's... How cool is that? You know? That's where things should be. You know? Worrying about what's healthy rather than the details. There you go. And Dave had put in the chat room, our Amazon listing is pagancenteredpodcast.com slash books. Awesome. We got an Amazon listing? Yes, we do. Ah, cool. As Grant, or Saturn says in the chat room, safe, happy, not hurting others, you're good. Yeah, but what fun is that? <laughs> Uh, if I can't make at least two or three people miserable a day, I don't think I'm doing anything. <laughs> Sorry. But hey, we're seriously off topic here. Trying to think if there's anything we didn't cover. Mom, is there anything else that you'd, you'd have questions, whether it's details or, or general? Not really. Um... It's like if I had any question as far as if, she, you know, Christina decides that she wants to or is going to, it would be understanding what she's expecting from it. You know, talking to her, uh, knowing that I can turn to you guys uh, to 
to answer my questions, it, it will help a lot. But as far as telling other people, it's to me a lot of it covers the same thing, whether whether it's any religion that they're they're looking into. Um, the hormones that you you say that the teenage teenagers go through that change, where sometimes you, they're just looking to see if you are human as a parent. You know, geez, you don't they don't see the other side of you because why you're a parent and you're trying to be that strong person um, so showing them but I mean they're, they're going to push your buttons so how do you know that it's truly that they want to get into another religion or they're just trying to get a rise out of you just to see if you are alive um. <laughs> good night I'm getting poked here that's actually a good that's actually a good point so let's Let's look at it from both point of views. Okay, let's say they're debating becoming Wiccan just because they want to get a rise out of you. Okay, yeah. if you fight with them, you give them what they want anyway. Uh, probably sit down, have an intelligent conversation. Say, hey, okay, why you want to do this? You know, tell me about this. Oh, is this what you like about it? Maybe some other stuff will crop up. Yeah, it could be, uh, well, because. Well, I, I, you don't understand. I'm not talking to you about it. Then um, you know that you, you kind of do have to get some kind of feedback. You have to be patient uh, and be observant because it could be where they really don't know what they're getting into and they don't understand it. And having that... Uh, your statements on trying not to make a big confrontation over it so that you're, you allow them to possibly open up to you. If that's what they're looking for religion-wise, then you, you would expect that it will open up a door between the two of you. Uh, but if it's where they're, they're just pushing a button, then it just might go by the wayside. You know, if you're pulling up information and saying, okay, well, you know, what path are you considering? And, well, I don't know. And it's like, if you show that interest, then it might be where, um, well, I'm not sure. And maybe that's all it was. They just are rebelling at that point, and this just sounded like a good thing to put in there. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times, if they're questioning and they're rebellious and they really just want to push buttons yeah just like Scurvy said if, if you fight back that's what they're looking for but as soon as you're supportive right then you've just ruined their whole plot now they have to go find something else and if they oh. drop it well then <laughs> then they've dropped it well look at it from a tactical standpoint if they're bringing it up as a point of uh, cause and strife, you've already lost that one. So might as well go with it and take the dice roll. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if, if the kid's doing it just to get a rise, yeah, yeah. You make a big enough stink and they might get into paganism for all the wrong reasons. Not that we know anybody who's done that, but, uh, That really don't work out so well. And, or you could go, you say, okay, well, if you're going to do this, or you're going to do it right, let's research it. Tell me why you want to do that, you know. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it's from the, parent, from the parent point of view, it might not be the best choice, but sometimes you don't get the best choice. Sometimes you just sort of, make the best of your choices. So now that we've gone on for almost three hours, do we want to wrap up and do final thoughts? Yeah. My bed beckons me. <laughs> Scurf!
You only visit me a couple hours every day. <laughs> and my final thought officially is, um, you know. <laughs> nice. My final thought is, just because your kid came out as pagan, and he wants to hold your the, his newborn cousin in the same day, doesn't make it related. I sense a good story behind this. <laughs> right? I'm not sharing. Okay. You're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> My final thought is, just because someone has come out as pagan, does not mean that person has changed who they are. Don't forget that. They haven't suddenly morphed into someone you never knew. I think my final thought is, child, friend, husband, wife, you know, whatever it happens to be. People are people, no matter what faith pe people follow, you'll still have good people and bad people. So, um, try not to make, there are certain, uh, fights that you, you need to have, and certain fights that you don't need to have, and, uh, choose your battles wisely, and just do the best that you can with your friends and with your children or with your parents. Um, you know, fight the fights that need to be fought, and not necessarily go overboard on the ones that don't change who you are, and, um, try to help people be the best they can be, uh, no matter what faith path they are, or how un understanding or understanding that they are. My final thought is I've been tinkering with video for at least an hour, and I think I finally got a way for us to record in clarity, as opposed to people thinking that they got the wrong prescription glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> My final thought is it's not always hormones. Sometimes it's the desire to prove integrity. Mm, good point. Oh. Mom? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't know you wanted my input. Open-minded and patience. I think if you have at least both of those, I think will help to for uh, both to grow and understand more of what is going on and their life and the world just the world's going too fast you know patience don't rush it understand you know the communication there's too much of rush rush going on and people don't want to stop to take the time to know it's just easier to do it this way don't bother me we need to put that back in there that's it. Well, my final thought is to remember that these days so many people don't have any faith. That if your child comes to you and says that they believe in another faith, to be glad that your child has found faith. Whether it's someone else's or yours. And to try and remember that when you're trying to figure out how to deal with the conflict. I think my final thought is going to be a two-parter. Um, going off of what Brandon said, I was told a piece of advice. If you want to fight over something, think for a second and to yourself and say, will it matter in five years? Will this fight right here matter in five years? And if it won't, 
then there's no reason to fight over it. If you feel that it will matter, then it matters enough to take your time with it. And the other part is if you, whether you're parent or child, if you say you love that person and you say that you respect that person, then love them and respect them enough to respect their choices. Even if it may be the wrong choice, respect the fact that they've made a choice and be there for them no matter what. If you want to be in their life, that's it may be a sacrifice in your comfortability, but that's a, a part of relationships and a very important one. And I think we got everybody. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that does it for this episode of PCP, the Pagan Standard Podcast. Uh, insert some witty remark here, perhaps a commercial, and we'll see you all next week. Night. Yay! Bye. Bye. Farewell. Good night. We should do that whole deal where everybody says goodnight to everybody by name one these days. <laughs> oh, God. Well, let's not do that. <laughs> right? Especially when we have 30 people in the room. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. I was just Kirby, thinking. Kirby, we, you get to post-produce that. We would, have to, <laughs> we would have to do final thoughts like 45 minutes early. Right? And welcome to this episode of PCP. Thank you for listening. That's all for tonight. Good night, Scurry. <laughs> Good night, Amber. Good night, Dave. Night, Saturn. Night, Dave. Night, Scurvy. Night, Brandon. Good night, Anubis. Good night, Amber's mom. <laughs> Good night, Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Amber's mom was going to be listed as Amber's mom in the credits. Probably. <laughs> I was going, I was going to say no. You know, I won't be offended if all that stuff that I said is is edited out. You know that. <laughs> um, I don't think you said anything that is worth editing out. You were uh, pretty pivotal in this episode. <laughs> I, I told you you'd be great. <laughs> And I told you you'd have stuff to say. See, now you were all worried. Well, I thought you were just kind of looking for questions more so than... Feedback's feedback. I think I'm editing out half of what I said, though. I'm a dumbass. You can edit out everything I said. You are not. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't say anything. You mean hi? (laughs) Hi, I'm Dave, and welcome to PCP. (laughs) Yeah, I think we need those parts, dear. I was here somewhere. Not necessarily. <laughs> on, the, uh, so second episode, on the second episode of Pagan Men, I re-recorded the intro. So it made sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's always a good idea. <laughs> well, you said first, and it wasn't the first, so... Oh, okay, good point. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. just so everybody knows, just so everybody knows, on the Kelly Mays episode, I've removed about 20 minutes of, um, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, is that in Dropbox for me to push show notes to? Oh, uh, yeah, I still got like 20-some minutes to go. <laughs> okay. I did some as we were going, but it's like every five seconds she's saying, um, you know. You'd think a professional vocalist would be better. Well, right. No, I was. Everything I mean, I li- he says is edited, so it works that way. So it's like <clears> us throat> being throat> on the radio, we just like be like awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> right. Silence is had, easy. You, you could have had okay. the sound of my dog slurping the water ditch if I didn't mute it. <laughs> I'll ask Amber to put a show note in for it. <laughs> 
this pause is for dogs drinking. <laughs> you did. She was pretty thirsty there, so it was quite a while. <laughs> oh, originally when I was listening to that, I was like, okay. Yeah, there was no potty language. Yeah, this will be quick to clean up. <laughs> just run through some filters, clean up a little audio here and there. I think you just should just leave the rest of her ums in. Or just make a techno remix of her ums. I'm not I'd like that. Audacity to have a, a feature where wherever you deleted one into another file in sequence. That'd be awesome for techno remixes. Just an entire eight minute segment of um, um, um. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you gotta put a beat to it. And then Kelly Mays will be forever known as a techno artist, even though she's a rapper. <laughs> That's just mean. <laughs> I don't think it's any meaner than stuff we've already done to her. Pretty much. That's okay. I'm going to give a, a try at a techno remix. <laughs> oh, it's it, uh, like uh, your first episode uh, of PCP. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I guess as long as you don't turn it into a drinking game. Oh, God. Uh, no, there's a, a, a certain other podcaster who's um, earned a special place in my heart. <laughs> the gay I'm going Irish to make it a point to use his words that. in context. Because that's highly because it's highly offensive to him. I've never met such a self-loathing person. I know, it's awesome. It's a creative form of self-loathing. Yeah, it is. Okay, who are you talking about? Christian Day? Yeah. Okay. I was confused for a second. So, how much audio do I have left over here? <laughs> nice setting. I think even I would probably kill over after the first hour. <laughs> I'd be good. I has a good tolerance. Now, Brandon, on the other hand... What? Something shiny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brandon wouldn't make it through the game. <laughs> what game? He'd be playing Legos. That's why he wouldn't make it through the game. <laughs> I, I We're will talking never. about making a drinking game out of every time somebody says um in the recording. Oh man, I wouldn't make it through. <laughs> you'd have two ums and you'd be like, oh, I'm on board. Ooh, there goes. <laughs> I will never forget being at the store down in, uh, what was it, Nags Head? And you being like, no, get out of the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas is coming. Get away from the Legos. <laughs> and then she makes fun of me whenever I call her mom. <laughs> or she gets angry at me. That's what I have to used to have to do with Jay at Car Lots. <laughs> no, you just got the one you have. Well, at least I don't have to do that at the car lot. Yeah. I wish you did. It. So I think most of us, if we made it a drinking game, we'd get halfway through the episode and we'd all be completely and utterly plastered. That is before editing. After editing, we'll sound sober. Yeah, we'll, we'll still make it sober. I don't know if we sound sober after editing now. <laughs> Good point. 30 minutes worth of audio to go through. Okay. But I'm, ex I'm exporting the uh, after hours chunk right now. Okay. So that'll be done tomorrow easily. 
Okay, and just let me know when you put it in Dropbox, and then I can do show notes ASAP and get them out. Yeah. I'm beginning to learn a lesson here. What? Whenever I say, that'll be easy, it isn't. Hmm. <laughs> that's why, no matter what it is, you'd be like, damn, this is going to be a pain in the ass. Yeah. Then whenever it's not, you're pleasantly happy. Expect that was, the worst, hope for the best. Well, then you're always pleasantly surprised. I want to make a... Uh, YouTube Techno Remix. So, we got to break my... Uh, I've toyed around with the Pinnacle Studios song, but I want to really have some fun with it. Oh, God. I don't really get a feeling this involves a certain ritual video. Oh! And I wanted to tell you guys, Brandon found this really awesome trail on um, behind my house. So, when you guys come down, we are definitely going back there. It is so pretty! So, it will make me happy. I got a good place to share that besides the beach. Yay. Star asks that you do a remix of, how do I say this? <laughs> we should just ambush Star and pull her in. Hurry up before she hears it on the play. <laughs> 